Hey there, everyone. It's Andrew here. Last year, I had a goal of reading 10 novels in Korean, my second language. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to meet my goal, and I only ended up reading six books. There are many reasons why I think I wasn't able to reach this goal, and most of them are probably familiar to a lot of you. Things like getting busy, having life get in the way, feeling unmotivated, being tired, procrastinating too much, losing sight of the big picture, or generally just being lazy. These all played a part in preventing me from reaching my goal. But there was another thing that had an effect on how much I read last year, and it wasn't immediately evident to me. But now that I've had some time to think about my reading habits from last year, I realized that decision paralysis is partially responsible for my failure. Let me explain. Decision paralysis is the idea that having a lot of options available to us can be overwhelming. The word paralysis, let me say that again slowly because it's a difficult word to say, paralysis, this word means unable to move. So for example, someone might have paralysis in their legs after being in a car accident. In that situation, the person would be unable to walk or move their legs, right? Due to the accident. We could also talk about political paralysis, where nothing happens in a country. No new laws, no decisions made, no progress, because the political parties spend more time fighting against each other than actually working together, for example. Maybe you can think of some countries that operate like that. So this word paralysis then is all about being stuck, about not moving. As you can imagine, decision paralysis is when you can't make decisions. You have options, but you can't make a selection. And although having many options might seem awesome, in fact, it can be a negative thing because it makes it too difficult to actually make a choice. So what happened to me last year during my reading challenge is that I spent too much time choosing what books to read. I'd finish a book, and instead of carrying that momentum and that motivation from finishing the book into starting a new book, I'd instead turn to the internet and look for the next book to read. And this was a bad idea because it took me down the rabbit hole of spending time online. I'd browse through online bookstores, I'd read book reviews, I downloaded and read samples from ebooks that I found online, I'd watch YouTubers, also known as booktubers, review some of their favorite books, I'd even watch interviews with authors or listen to interviews with authors in podcasts. So when it came time to find the next book to read, I just spent way too much time looking for the best book ever, and I actually spent not very much time reading. In my quest to read, I ended up just wasting time. If instead I had just picked any old book randomly off a bestsellers list, for example, and then started reading it without worrying about whether it was the perfect book for me or not, I would have had more time to read. And most likely, I would have read more books, and maybe even I would have achieved my reading goal of finishing 10 books last year. In today's Chatterbox episode, we're going to explore decision paralysis in more detail. And a little later on, I'll be joined by my co-host Anna, and we'll chat about this topic together. If you're new to our Chatterbox series or are not sure what it's about, let me explain. Chatterbox is the QLIP series for intermediate and advanced level English learners where we talk about compelling topics, trending current events, or hot issues. Chatterbox is designed to help you improve your English listening and speaking and help you reach your English goals. There's a transcript and study guide for this episode on our website, qlips.com, C-U-L-I-P-S.com, for all QLIPS members. Please visit the website to learn about how you can become a member and to join the QLIPS community. So the idea we're talking about today is decision paralysis and inability to make choices. 
My name is Sheena Iyengar, and I'm a professor at the Columbia Business School. Professor Iyengar is an academic who has thought a lot about this topic. She wrote a popular book called The Art of Choosing and has made two appearances at TED where she talked about making choices. I have spent, um, I guess now, almost 30 years studying choice. Uh, why do people want choice? Uh, what are the effects of giving people choices? And how? what can we do to improve people's experiences with both choosing as well as the outcomes of their choice? In an interview about choice making, Dr. Iyengar described the exact problem I encountered when trying to find the perfect book to read. When we have a lot of choice, we can't handle it because we then get mired in all these details, which then distracts us from our larger goals. And in one of her TED Talks, she said, When someone can't see how one choice is unlike another, or when there are too many choices to compare and contrast, the process of choosing can be confusing and frustrating. Instead of making better choices, we become overwhelmed by choice, sometimes even afraid of it. Choice no longer offers opportunities, but imposes constraints. It's not a marker of liberation, but of suffocation by meaningless minutia. When we have nearly unlimited choices, making a decision can be really difficult. And instead of giving us new opportunities, it can actually paralyze and restrict us. I really like the last sentence by Dr. Iyengar when she said that choice is not a marker of liberation, but a suffocation by meaningless minutia. It's not a marker of liberation, but of suffocation by meaningless minutia. Okay, let's break that down. It's a little bit complicated. The word suffocation means dying because there's no air to breathe. And the word minutia means the very small details. So basically what Dr. Iyengar is saying here is that when we have unlimited choices, we get so caught up in this meaningless minutia, in the small, small details, that we end up suffocating, or in other words, doing nothing. This is very similar to what writer and psychologist Barry Schwartz has called the paradox of choice. Have you heard this word before? Paradox? Paradox? A paradox describes a person or a situation that has two opposite features, which makes it seem really weird. For example, it's a paradox that smartphones were designed to save us time and help make life easier, but in fact, we end up wasting a lot of time and working more or feeling more stressed out because of smartphones. Or we could say that a shy person who likes to have conversations with other people is a paradox. In the case of the topic that we're talking about today, the paradox of choice, well, this is the idea that having many choices can make you better off. It's good to have choices, right? But all these choices can cause you to freeze and do nothing, which in the end actually makes you worse off. Let's hear from Barry Schwartz himself about it. All of this choice has two effects, two negative effects on people. One effect, paradoxically, is that it produces paralysis rather than liberation. Schwartz goes as far to say that having too many choices can even affect how happy we feel. Adding options to people's lives can't help but increase the expectations people have about how good those options will be. And what that's going to produce is less satisfaction with, with results, even when they're good results. So maybe that's another reason for me not to spend so much time looking for the perfect book to read. When there are so many choices available, it's likely that I may feel like there's always a better option. That really sums up the issue into three nice words, doesn't it? A better option. FOBO stands for fear of a better option. Someone who spent a lot of time thinking and writing about better options is the writer Patrick McGuinness. You've probably heard the expression FOMO before. If you're a longtime listener of Culips, you'll know that we talked about it on Culips before as well. FOMO, the fear of missing out. McGuinness is the guy who coined that expression. 
To coin something means to be the first person to use a new word or expression. So in other words, then, McGuinness created the term. FOMO, as I said, is the fear of missing out, and it describes the stress or anxiety you may feel when you see other people doing fun things on social media. So for example, if you pop open your Instagram and you notice a friend eating at an amazing restaurant and another friend having fun at a concert, uh, maybe a coworker traveling the world, you see all these pictures, uh, but you're just at home lying in your bed, scrolling through social media, scrolling through Instagram. Maybe in that moment, you'd feel kind of like a loser or that you're not living life to the fullest. You might feel like you're just letting the world pass you by. That's what FOMO is. But McGinnis actually coined another term. It's not quite as popular as FOMO, but it relates to our topic of conversation today. The term is FOBO, F-O-B-O, or the fear of better options. FOBO relates to all the things that we've been talking about today so far. When you have many options to choose from, it can be hard to make a decision about which one to choose because you're afraid of making the wrong choice. Let's listen to McGinnis explain it. It's a fear that when you're making a decision that if you choose something, something better might come along. So, you know, for example, you ordering food at the restaurant and you order that dish. And what if somebody at your table gets something that looks better? Or say you're going on Netflix and you're trying to pick a movie. You keep searching and searching for the perfect movie, right? And I think we all do that. There are 7,000 potential choices on Netflix. And so FOBO is something that comes from living in a very in an age where we have so much choice. You go on the internet, you can buy anything you want, you can download anything you want. And so as a result, it makes it difficult for us to just choose one thing because we don't want to make the wrong choice. You don't do anything, you're paralyzed. Hey, Anna. Hi, Andrew. I guess we could start, Anna, by maybe talking about your decision-making style. How do you generally go about making decisions? I would say that it's a bit of a mixed bag. Sometimes I think I make good decisions and sometimes I make decisions in the heat of the moment that are perhaps not the best thing to do. So I think I can be a little bit erratic, but I generally base my decisions. I'm very much risk averse. So I'm always kind of weighing up the different options. And to be honest, it can take me quite a long time to make a decision. And one of my goals um, this year actually has to be more decisive, which is basically better at making decisions or, you know, just choosing one thing and just sticking with it rather than kind of spending all this time thinking about just be like, okay, I've had to think about the options, what's best. Okay, let's go for it. If it doesn't work, it's okay. I can always fix it later. So trying to have more of that type of attitude, which is quite difficult to put into practice, I have to be honest. <laughs> um, what about you, Andrew? Uh, I try to make decisions quickly. Uh, I guess it really depends on what type of decisions we're talking about, right? If it's small things, then I try to just make them quickly. You know, what are we going to eat for dinner? Are we going to have chicken or turkey? I don't care. Let's just eat whatever one, like flip a coin, right? Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess for bigger life decisions, you know, like to get married or to not get married, to live in apartment A or to live in apartment B, to live in Korea or to live in Canada. Those I spend more time on. And I like to just let ideas marinate in my head for a long time before I make a decision. So I kind of put no deadline on a decision. Or if I know there's a deadline that I have to make a decision by, then I try to start thinking about it well in advance. I start to get the wheels rolling in my head, uh, weighing the pros and cons and trying to see things from all perspectives before I actually make the decision. I hate being rushed into things. Like I, I don't like to have to make a decision very quickly, especially a significant one. So I try to give it a lot of time. 
I think the brain is pretty remarkable at doing a lot of calculating in the background. And, uh, you know, when I'm sleeping or walking around or just doing my daily everyday things, uh, if I have a big decision to make, I kind of think that my brain is calculating the pros and cons of that decision for me subconsciously. So if I give it enough time to do the calculation, then I think that helps me <laughs> come to a conclusion when it's time to make a decision. Nice. Yeah, I I, I, I never really thought about that before. But yeah, your brain's always just like, you know, doing little mini pros and cons lists in your head and kind of balancing like, is this going to be a good for me? Or maybe this is not the best thing to do right now. And I think like anything, making good decisions takes practice. You know, the more decisions that you have to make, the kind of better you get at doing it. I mean, I have, oh, and just to be clear as well, I'm not spending like uh, five hours choosing what I'm going to wear in the morning. Cause I know <laughs> it takes me a long time to make decisions, but what I meant to say was, you know, big decisions, life decisions, but right. well, well then again, this morning when I was getting dressed, I was like, oh, do I wear the white jumper or the brown one, uh, the black jeans or the blue jeans? And you're like, oh God, just put on a pair of trousers, Anna, and just get on with it. So, I mean, I do sometimes you know, on these low stake decisions, uh, you know, what to eat for lunch, what to wear in the morning. Sometimes I take too long doing those things as well. But I have a huge amount of respect for people that take big decisions on a daily basis. You know, I work with um, people who are, you know, taking big decisions, you know, big decisions about people, about companies, about budgets. And, you know, and it's big responsibility with decisions because once you've made a decision you know that's you've got to stick by that and you know that's the decision I made and that's that's why I did it and you've kind of got to take responsibility for that decision so I have a lot of respect for people who have to make difficult decisions a lot but as I said I think with practice you can get better at it but big decisions about your personal life I never like to do those things on a whim never exactly as you said I never like to rush those things because they could have a big impact on your life and um and your enjoyment I don't know it just can have a big impact on you so I do like to think those things through a lot but on the other hand nothing's forever everything is temporary so mm. even if something doesn't work and this is always something you have to try and have in the back of your mind, and I really try to do this as well, is it's not forever. So even if it doesn't work, there's going to be a way to fix it or solve it. Or, you know, I remember when I moved to Spain, for example, this is probably one of the biggest decisions I've ever made in my life so far was that move. So I spent some time thinking about it, going over it in my head. And, you know, I wouldn't want to do that just based on the click of a finger. No, I think that would feel un uncomfortable for me and it would make me feel more stressed out. So big life decisions, I think, are always, as you said, good to take your time, think about it and, you know, as best you can, but then you never know what's going to happen at the end of the day. You can plan things as much as you want, but once you take that decision, maybe maybe something really great will happen. Maybe it won't be so great. But big decisions, I think, are always best to to think through beforehand. What do you think about the role of intuition in decision making? Do you trust your gut? Do you go with your gut? Or do you like to think about just the rational facts, the logical side of life? I think it's a bit of both. And I love that thing about go with your gut because you just sometimes have a feeling about something and you're like, I know that this is the right thing to do. And that's kind of how I felt when I moved here to Spain and how I felt at other points in my life, significant points. I'm like, I need to make a decision. It's just something you feel, intuition in your gut. So I think you have to trust your intuition sometimes. It's it's like a sixth sense, I think. You're, you know, what you think is right and it just feels right. You can't really put your finger on it, but it just feels like the right thing to do. So I think it's a bit of both. But then we aren't humans aren't rational. So also at the same time, um, you know, there's a thing about never make a decision when you are angry, upset, um, really happy or, well, any extreme of emotion, like never make a big decision when you're like, I don't know, like you're like, oh yeah, I've just won a hundred thousand pounds. Now I'm going to bet my a hundred thousand pounds in the casino. Bad idea. <laughs> Bad you idea. Know, so it's like <laughs> any extreme of, um, emotion is not, they say that it's not good to make a decision. So I can agree with that. I think that 
I think most people would agree it's better to do it with a level head. So if we were to transition to talking more about the kind of daily choices that we have to make that can often cause decision paralysis, you gave uh, an awesome example of choosing your outfit in the morning, right? Do you wear the brown pants or do you wear the blue jeans? Like, uh, do you have any other examples from your daily life where sometimes maybe you get paralyzed and can't make a decision because you'd have too many options? Oh, yeah. One thing that really gets me is like what to eat for lunch. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, God. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's, ju it's just me, right? So I'm only okay. preparing lunch for me. Okay. But, oh, God. I, I wish I had a, a schedule, you know, of different meals every two weeks on a rotation. That would be the ideal world, the dream world. For me, it just doesn't work like that. So I'm going to the supermarket every day. I'm like, oh, what do I have for lunch today? Tuna, salad. And it's just like, <laughs> annoying but then i wish i could eat the same thing every day mm -hmm. i eat the same thing for breakfast interestingly i have porridge and that's pretty routine okay um because i can't be bothered to think about bread oh in the morning i'm just like i can't be bothered to think about <laughs> you know choices or whatever i'm just like give me the porridge and let's go sure but for lunch you know i'm thinking about different combinations different salads different cheeses i mean it's just ridiculous so but then if I ate the same thing every day, I'd be bored out of my mind. So I don't know. Yeah, I think eating for me, choosing what to have for lunch and dinner is just a daily a daily thing. But I mean, it's a lucky, it, to be honest, I have to say as well, it's a lucky thing to have that I could go and pick and have lunch. So I mean, you know, I'm not complaining too much. <laughs> I think a lot of people can relate to that uh, for sure. Uh, I'm thinking about it right now, honestly, in the back of my mind, Anna, we're getting close to dinner time here where I am. Mm. So I'm thinking, hmm, what am I going to have for dinner? And it is taking up a little bit of my mental energy, uh, making this kind of decision. I know some people are really organized and they have meal plans and schedules that they follow, but uh, I'm not that kind of person. So for me, definitely uh, dinner and lunch is something that I think about. Breakfast is easy because I just drink coffee for breakfast and that's that. But lunch and dinner, <laughs> I have to spend some time thinking about. What about FOBO? Anna, FOBO, fear of a better option. When you think, ah, should I pull the trigger on this decision? Should I wait and see if a better option comes around? Have you ever experienced FOBO before? Oh, absolutely. Many times. I'm, I'm going to use the example at the moment I'm looking for a flat. Um, to, I'm looking to move to a, to a new flat. Okay. And I mean, there's so many flats in Madrid. There's so many flats. I mean, literally, there, there are so many flats. But, you know, I'm like, I like this one, but mm, I don't know. It's not quite right. I'll, I'll wait for the next one or I'll have a look at another one. Um, and then I'll, you know, I'll wait a couple of weeks and I'm like, well, I'll, I'll wait for the for the next one. So it's like, the grass is always greener. You always think there's going to be something better or there's going to be this amazing flat that's going to become available next week. And, you know, there's always something because, you know, I'm not looking for a flat, you know, a, a really, really expensive flat. So I have a budget, of course, like most people. And, you know, with my budget, I can afford a certain um, level. And, you know, there's always something that's you're going to have to sacrifice on something, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's the size, the location or the I don't know, the the decor or whatever. You're going to have to sacrifice on something. So I find it really hard to make a decision with that. And I actually backed out of a flat partly because, you know, I'd gone through the process and I, you know, I, I was just about to sign the contract. And then my intuition told me coming back to that thing about the gut, I just like yeah something just doesn't feel quite right and I actually decided to back out of that even though I'd gone through all the process everything seemed fine there was just something at the last minute that made me think no I think I should hold out for a little bit longer and I don't know if that was a good decision actually to be honest I think <laughs> it probably would have been a good flat for me um, but it, I think it came back to this thing about oh maybe there's something better maybe you know, I could find a flat in a bit of a better um, spot for me because it, you know, so yeah, it happens to me. Does it happen to you as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the 
example that you brought up of searching for a, a new place to live or a real estate in general is a real good one. I'm reminded of a conversation that I had with one of my friends recently and uh, we're from the same place in Canada. We're hometown friends. And so we were talking about the real estate market in our hometown. And uh, like so many places around the world these days, Anna, the housing market in Canada is on fire. And the average price of a house in Canada now is insane. It's like over $700,000 Canadian, which is wow. very, very, very high. And my friend's been thinking about buying a house for a couple of years. And he was saying, oh, I should have bought this house two years ago. It was so much cheaper two years ago. And now the market has grown so much in those two years that, uh, you know, trying to find a house that's equivalent is almost impossible because all the prices have gone up so much. So he was saying, oh, should I get in the market now or should I wait and see what happens? Uh, and he was looking around at different real estate options. And I told him, you're going to have to make a decision. If you want to buy a house, just buy it now because it doesn't look like the market is slowing down at all. And maybe two years from now, you'll look back at this moment and still have some regret about not pulling the trigger and, and buying something. Or yeah. he might be very happy because the market crashed and he didn't make a bad investment. It's really hard to say when it comes to investments and making these kinds of big purchases. But I think that was an example of FOBO. You know, at the time, he wasn't sure if he should buy that house or wait or see what's happening. Uh, and he just waited too long. And then in the end, now things have changed completely and he's not able to buy that kind of house anymore. Yeah. And that's a really good example about these, you know, these big investing and things like that and making a big life purchase. You know, buying a house is a, is a massive thing. I mean, at the moment, I'm I'm only looking to, to rent somewhere. But I imagine that when I when I come to hopefully in the future, um, you know, own my own house, then I'm, oh, I can't even imagine how long that's going to take me to make a decision on, <laughs> on that because um, it's a big thing. But I always feel like if I approach something where I have to make a decision in, in my life, uh, you know, something big, not what we're having for breakfast, but something big. And, you know, I'm going back and forth with it. I'm going around in circles. That kind of tells me something. That tells me that I'm probably not ready to make that decision. Because if I'm so unsure and I've got all of these doubts in my head, then that kind of tells me maybe I need to look into it a little bit more. You know, and I also think getting a, an outside perspective can sometimes be really useful. So somebody who will like throw back at you, like maybe what you're not seeing or give you a little, give you a different perspective when making a decision can sometimes be useful or more confusing. So again, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Yeah. If you can have somebody to help you though, and guide you and show you your blind spots, what maybe you're missing in that situation because some things can be emotional for us when we're making the decision, but they're not really to the person that's your friend or that's helping you consulting sure. with you. Right. So they can point out those things to you, maybe tell you something that you don't always want to hear, but can be actually really good advice in the end when it comes to, to making a decision. I think it's again, coming back to that idea of, I guess the thing about decision paralysis, and then there's the the other hand, which is the paradox of choice where, you know, you have so many options uh, that it actually you think that it's going to be quicker to choose something. But actually having all of the options makes it much more difficult. If you only have to pick between brown and blue, but then if you have to pick between brown, blue, pink, yellow, green, red, purple, <laughs> turquoise, you know, you're like, oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to pick. So definitely I, I i the paradox of choice does definitely ring true and i think is very prevalent in our society especially at the moment because we can do so many things um what what do we do with ourselves <laughs> one thing that i've started doing to fix this problem in a very small way is the queuing system that i'm seeing on a lot of different apps these days for example on netflix right instead of um you know, when my wife and I want to watch a movie, sometimes we'll scroll through Netflix and keep looking through until we can find the perfect movie. But these days when I see something, something pops up, but I'm not really ready to watch a movie, I'll just add it to my queue. 
or to my favorites. I'm not exactly sure the term that they use on Netflix, but there's this area where you can save movies that you want to watch in the future and kind of all put them in that one place. So then when it is movie night and we're sitting down to watch something, I already have a selection of like the top three or four movies that I'm interested in watching and I don't have to endlessly scroll through all of their content trying to find what I want to watch. And I think this is going to save me a lot of time and um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and do this kind of thing in other aspects of my life as well. When it comes to reading books, I'll just make a list of books that I want to read and then just read them in order. I won't even think about what is the best one on this list. If it makes it onto my list, it means it's uh, worthy of reading and I will just select the top one on the list. And I'm hoping, you know, that this kind of system of queuing up ideas uh, can help me to make decisions faster and save me some time in the end. Yeah, the Netflix one is a killer or any streaming service where you're like, okay, what do we watch? And then it's like half an hour trying to choose something <laughs> yes. and you start watching it and then you're like, oh, I don't like it. And then you go back to the beginning. And and again, it's like you've got thousands of films, documentaries, anything that you want to watch and then you can never find anything to watch. So, I mean, that is the, just the, the perfect example of the paradox of choice. You know, it's like if you only had a decision between two movies, it would be, probably be a lot easier than having thousands but you know obviously it's great that you can just scroll through and, and have a look but I like the I, I like that idea I, I I hadn't I hadn't thought about that I'm actually just not trying to watch Netflix anymore because <laughs> it's probably a, even a better idea <laughs> yeah I, I'm trying not to watch Netflix I'm trying only to watch Netflix at the weekends now because um you know I'd get into a habit of like watching it in the evening and I'm like oh no I'm just gonna leave it for the weekends because you know otherwise it infiltrates um, in my everyday life and I prefer to keep it as a treat rather than a rather than a routine mm. um, but yeah Netflix is a killer <laughs> for that All right, Anna, that brings us to the end of this episode. But I want to thank all of our listeners for joining us here today. And guys, I hope you were able to learn a lot with this episode. And of course, congratulations on getting some English listening practice in as well. That is exactly what you need to do to build your English fluency. So keep up the good work. Now, Anna and I have shared our opinion on this topic, but we are very curious about you and we'd love to know what you think. And I think the rest of the QLips community would also like to know what you think. So please visit our website, which is QLips.com and you can leave a comment there and everyone can read it and we can start a discussion. So you could tell us about what you learned in this episode or maybe share a story about when you experienced FOBO or decision paralysis. This episode was made possible thanks to all of our wonderful supporters. And if you enjoy Coolips and find it useful for you to build your English skills, we'd love it if you could help us by leaving a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast app. And of course, you can also support us by signing up and becoming a QLips member. There are tons of great benefits when you are a member, like you'll get access to the study guides and transcripts for all of our episodes, plus much more. To learn about all the details and to become a member, just visit QLips.com or check out the link in the description. Guys, we'll be back soon with another brand new episode and we'll talk to you all then. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.